Thank you very much. So this is the culmination of a series of talks that I've been doing, a series of workshops I've done to try and gather material just for this. So you guys are really special. I did a keynote called Respect for People a couple of weeks ago. Um, I actually got into a lot of trouble on Twitter for that keynote. So um, I'm going to be making some probably quite pithy, sound bitey quotes. If you take those out of context, I will end up having fights on Twitter with people. Uh, my Twitter name is up there, please go ahead. <laughs> um, I wanted to start by sharing a story, because we all think the truth is quite important, right? And being honest in our work and in our processes is really important too. I was acting as release manager for this project, and it was my first essentially management role, my first time I had done anything other than just be a dev. And we were doing something akin to Scrum, very similar to Scrum, it's called extreme programming. It's like Scrum, but it works. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to try not, I'm going to be talking about lean later as well, so don't worry, they'll, they'll get their turn. Um, <laughs> so we were doing these iterations and we had decided what we were going to do for the iteration. And because we had a little bit of time left to, towards the end of the iteration, the devs picked up another task and, and the, another thing they needed to do, and they were trying to take it on board, but they couldn't test it, because to test the work they'd done, they needed another server from the DevOps team. And I went to see the DevOps team, and this was on the, the Tuesday, and the end of the iteration was on a Thursday. Um, and they said, you know what, it's not going to happen. Um, we had somebody starting that server, and he's gone on holiday, and none of us know where he's got to, and even if we started again right now, it would still take a couple of days to get it to you. And if you do find any bugs, you're not going to fix them. And I went, don't worry about it. It wasn't something we had agreed at the beginning of the sprint. Nobody's really ex expecting this. And then I was in a meeting, and there was a program manager. Uh, and he said, OK, so what about this other story? You know, you've, you've done all the others. What about this one that you haven't finished yet? I said, oh, well, we didn't agree we were going to do it at the beginning of the sprint, so it won't be a problem. He said, we did. I said, we didn't. He said, yes, we did. I s and this was the mistake I made. I said, I wrote down everything that we agreed to. It's on my pad in the other room. I can go and get it if you want. So I had a record of the truth. And towards the end of this meeting, he started behaving really oddly. He said, right, I need somebody to go and talk to the DevOps team and get this server. And I said, I've already done that. And they're really busy with some more important stuff. They're not going to have the resources to get us this server. And he just turned around to the rest of the group. He said, I need somebody to go and get that server. And one of the architects, eventually volunteered, and everybody's feeling really uncomfortable on my behalf. One of the architects volunteered to go and get it and, and, and talk to the dev team. And afterwards, I spoke to this gentleman, and I said to him, you know, I, I get that you want somebody to go and chase this up. I really have already spoken to them. And he went, uh-huh. I said, the, we really need the architects here, because there's a lot of big technical things have gone through the pipeline. If anything's wrong with them, we need him here. We're very close to the end. We're about to release. He should be with the team. And he went, oh, all right then. And it took me months to work out that he did actually believe me. He did believe I was telling the truth. But I had presented it in a way which embarrassed him. And he had essentially got really defensive about it and, and behaved in this strange way towards me. And it made me realize there are some times when maybe there are different ways to present the truth or different aspects to the truth that we need to consider. And then I thought, well, hold on, wouldn't it be just nice if we could just not worry about any of this political stuff and just be really honest? Now, devs, how many devs are here? because this is quite a technical conference. So I thought I would start with you guys. You're pretty rational. And as a group, I found not generally interested in, in lying. I was a dev, I'm, I'm not really interested in lying much. So I thought I would start with some code, okay? And, and show you the kind of things I see devs do. 
This is a genuine piece of code which I saw. This was a group who were doing BDD for the first time, and they were doing it at a unit level. They asked me to come in and look at their examples, also known as unit tests. And this was what they had. It should be France, Germany, or Italy. And I said, so what's the problem? And they said, well, we don't know what to do now, because this is the code. <laughs> Returns true if it's France, Germany, or Italy, or Spain. I'm like, OK. Well, something is lying. Right? There's, is it the code that's lying or what it should do? And they said, well, it, should, it did do that, but do we have to change these names every time we change the code? I said, forget what the code is actually doing. What do you want the code to do? And they said, well, it should tell us if it falls under EU regulation 1426 or something like that. And while they were talking to me, I typed. Yeah? And they went, is that it? You just type whatever we say. I went, BDD. <laughs> well done. <laughs> OK. It turns out that honesty is really easy when you know what you want. And you express what you want. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a, a change agent um, earlier today. He's an internal organizational change person. And he's been trying to get the project managers to help him with this visualization. And he keeps telling them, you know, if you do this visualization, it'll be really good for you. And the project manager's like, we don't need it. And he says, no, it'll be really good. Uh, and you should do it. And they're like, no. He's the one who wants it. I said, have you tried telling them that you want it? Because then they'll be like, oh, OK. <laughs> you know, Say what you want. Um, yeah, so they also changed the name of the method. Now, we know as devs that that's just bad code, right? And we're used to going, and you're all really good devs. You'd never write anything like that anymore. Um, <laughs> but yet, I have seen really good devs walk into a room that looks like this. This is actually a picture I drew of a real room. Those are all story cards on the wall, over 200 of them, 647.5 story points, or the equivalent. It was thereabouts, right? So there have been a lot of estimating went into here. Now, this is the point where I have to be really careful with my language, because the last talk I did, I said that estimates were lying. And I got some people who went, you actually went there. You really said that. Um, I'm going to be more exact about what I mean by that. This is one of my favorite books. This is Waltzing with Bears. It is a tiny little book about risk in projects. If you haven't read it, please, please go read it. It's the most amazing thing. I actually put it on a par with the Mythical Man Month. Um, and it says right at the beginning of chapter one, if a project has no risks, don't do it. Who was in Dan North's talk earlier? Anyone? Few people, right? He says, rule four, somebody's already done it before. If somebody has already done it before, go and get the thing that they use to do it, or go hire them, or go buy it off the shelf. Don't try and solve the problem yourself. The only problems you should be solving yourself are the ones where there's something new, something really important that you've never done before as part of it. And if you're going to do something new that you've never done before, it's going to be a bit risky, and it might not work. Or it might work the third time or the fifth time. But you can't tell me that you know how long it's going to take. Now, on this project, I was actually measuring how long things were taking, and we were trying to do one-week iterations. I realized that more than half of the things we were trying to do were taking two weeks more. So we really had no idea how long this stuff was taking. And we were still trying to estimate it. Dan is a very good friend of mine. He's also written a blog post called The Perils of Estimation that talks about how he doesn't use the word dishonest, but I'm going to. Dishonest, 647.5 story points really is. Because that level of precision gives you an understanding of certainty that you simply don't have. 
So I'm going to say very carefully, if you're doing software development on a project with any kind of value whatsoever, estimates are lying, right? At Lunivor. <laughs> OK, I have been lying too. Uh, for years, I've been talking about this thing called feature injection. And I'm responsible for a lot of the anti-patterns out there. Feature injection was something that my friend Chris Matz came up with. He's one of the analysts who's been heavily involved in behavior-driven development and worked quite a lot with Dan Nor North and myself. And he says, this is how it splits up, right? You have an initial vision, which is something that's going to make money, save money, or protect your revenue. And a championing stakeholder comes up with this vision. And then you have these other stakeholders whose goals you need to address in order to go live. And from there, you develop some capabilities that the system will have to have, or people will have to have, users will have to have, in order to make that work. And you decide to deliver those capabilities with features, which are actual bits of software on a web, or on a, a phone, or a Windows console, whatever it is. And you split those up into stories to get fast feedback which is why we have stories. You can use scenarios, behavior-driven development scenarios, if you're into BDD, to do that. And then you get the code. Isn't it pretty? It's all rainbow colors. I like rainbows. OK. Here's what a real project looks like. A real project, you start by, even if you're not doing the massive breakup into stories, you start by having some idea of the problem you're trying to solve. And as you go through trying to solve it, you realize you forgot a bit. And then you didn't know about this other bit. And you find stuff out as you're going through. It turns out these guys are all interconnected. And then you don't need that bit, and you can't remember what that's for. And as you go through the project, you start seeing all these discoveries that you make along the way, because there were things that were new that you'd never done before. This is what a real project looks like, <laughs> yeah? So the Agile Manifesto is also lying. The Agile Manifesto says we're discovering how to build software by doing it and helping others do it. You know what? We already know how to build software. That's development. You practice doing it, you go to code retreats, you learn the techniques to build software. What we're really doing and what's new about Agile is we're discovering how to discover stuff and how to react to it early. So I have a thing that I would like you guys to do, which I believe is more honest than most of the processes we're doing right now. And that is to deliberately call out the difference between the stuff you've done before and the stuff you haven't and try and do as much of those hopes, those things you've never done before, as possible. And if anybody says, how long is that going to take? You turn around to them and go, you want me to lie, <laughs> right? One of the big problems is that human beings hate uncertainty. There have been a lot of studies done around it. Um, clinically depressed people have more problems with it than a lot of people. Um, but human beings, we, we love being certain. Uh, there's a thing called confirmation bias that I write a lot about, I talk a lot about, which is our ability to go out there with models of what's in our head and seek for things that reinforce those models. And we do it all the time because we're human. It's really, really hard to say, hey, maybe I'm wrong. If you've ever gone to get feedback from people, maybe for a yearly review, has anybody ever done that? Yeah, don't, yearly reviews with feedback and your tie to your pay are awful, but we do get made to do them sometimes. And you go to your friends <laughs> and you go, hey, would you do my review for me? It's really hard to go to somebody that you know has a problem with you or your work and talk to them and say, look, I really want your feedback. Because it feels a bit like a kick, you know? It makes us feel uncomfortable. So we like being certain about what we're doing and everything we tell ourselves about our models is often a lie. 
it isn't the case. Dan, Dan says we'd rather be wrong than uncertain, and it's not just the case. We would also rather lie than be uncertain, and a lot of us would rather hear lies than be uncertain. I have heard of project high-level you know, program managers, CIOs, CTOs, who don't like to see anything on the RAG reports, red, amber, green project reports, except green. And if they see anything that's not green, they will get very angry. And the devs in this room are thinking, yeah, project managers. How many of you get in trouble when the build fails? <laughs> a few of you, right. And uh, you, the build is broken. You've got to make it green. You broke the build. OK, if your builds are green the entire time, I would be tempted to check something in that's failing, just to make sure they're still doing something, you know? What are they there for, if not to catch and, and help you? Um, so if your build is always green, it may well be lying too. You know how you get all your tests guaranteed to be working 100% of the time? Delete them. <laughs> Please don't. OK. I wanted to touch on another lie that I keep hearing, and devs particularly, this is one I've heard from the devs a lot. We can't accept this into our backlog without clear acceptance criteria. Is there anybody who's worked in a team? And you don't have to tell me whether you've said this. Is there anyone who's worked in a team where that's been the case? Huge numbers of hands going up. I count like 20 or so. Um, this isn't true. My favorite thing with behavior-driven development is when you're talking through the scenarios and you talk to your business person and you go, so, you know, in this context, when we do this thing, what should happen then? They go, oh, I'm not sure. And then you know you've just uncovered some uncertainty. You've uncovered that, that differentiating new thing that's so important. Instead of insisting that they go away and have a bit more of a think about it, you can collaborate with them. Try something out. Make sure that it's really safe and easy to change because it's going to have to change. Chris Matz also says, you know, if we're going to pick a technology, don't pick the right technology because you don't know what the right technology is, otherwise you wouldn't be having to make a choice. Pick a technology that's easy to change. You might know it's wrong or think it's wrong, but you're going to have more information later. It's this thing called real options. You keep your options open. And that allows you to hold that uncertainty. So as an example, we were trying to decide whether to go with Link over SQL or nHibernate for this project. And we needed one flag from a database for each user. It was whether they had signed an agreement or not. So rather than go with any of those big weighty things, we went with simple data, tiny little library, will not be performant, will not be maintainable, but for that little problem, it was very easy to take it out and put something bigger in later when we had more information about what the right answer was. So all of those of you who are using Spring and start a project and go, hey, let's use Spring. Hands up, admit it. <laughs> yeah. I think that that is taking on too much certainty too early. You don't know whether you're going to need it and you don't know whether it's the right thing and it will bite you later. That's my experience anyway. OK. I'm going to touch on what I think is the biggest lie in the software development world ever. And I have heard this on almost every single project, apart from the ones who've learned from it and changed. Done. <laughs> right? This, this, this word, done. <laughs> I've heard devs, they, you know, to do, in progress, done, and they move it to the done column. Testers aren't done. That's software. That's software, it makes no sense. Testers aren't done with it. When the testers are done with it, then it's still got to go into your production. Probably there's bugs, because if you're doing something new, you got it wrong, because you've never done it before. OK, so there will always be unknown unknowns. That's what causes a lot of bugs. Um, when you release it to production, you're still not done then, because now you need to maintain it. And having accidentally brought down the Guardian Travel site once, I can tell you that sometimes you need to maintain it really quite fast. Um, 
So you're still not done, and there's still people using it, and they want changes to it. You are not done with your software until you've actually removed it from production and decided you no longer need the code. Right? Then you're done. Until then, somebody somewhere is still using the thing that you wrote, and you're not done with it. So if you see this word on your boards, have a think about what's really going on and try replacing it. One of the companies which has stopped using this word, it's a startup, and they, they were putting it into production and marking it done. And the business said, you know what, that's really winding us up because we still don't know at that stage whether anybody's using it or not. So we're going to call it awaiting validation. And we're going to have another column which we're going to split for features we've deleted and features we're keeping. They deleted features. How magic is that? So no, it's not. OK? Right. I'm, I am going to pick on lean in a moment, don't worry. User stories. Um, hands up who uses user stories? Is there anybody who's not on an Agile project, or at least something that's pretending to be an Agile project? Fantastic. So you all, you all know half a hand. You all know what a user story is, right? OK, here's a, here's a user story. As a user, I want to fill in a capture box. No, wait, hold on. <laughs> OK, they're not always for users. I had a UX guy come to me and say, no, look, you, you should always be thinking about the users first. You should get catered to their needs first and worry about everything else later. I said, great, can you take the adverts off then, please? A lot of the time, our user stories are not for the benefit of the users. I actually got a blog post where I talk about this. They're not user stories. Remember that I said there were other stakeholders whose goals you needed to achieve to go live? It's for them. They're stakeholder stories. So resist the urge to go as a user and try and work out who's actually going to benefit from it. I wanted to share this template with you because I think it's quite helpful. This is, again, Chris Matz. It's the feature injection template that he uses. And he puts the stakeholder goal first. In order to achieve some goal or some sub-goal that will lead to it, as a stakeholder, I want somebody else to do some stuff. That's honest. I want the users to fill in capture boxes so I don't have to moderate the site. Right? If, you, if you're concentrating and trying to phrase it in terms of the user every time, I guarantee some of those you're lying, and you're lying on the user's behalf. Don't do that. OK. I actually saw this on a website the other day. <laughs> Lean's next. <laughs> OK, I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about that. All right, metrics. This is, this is Lean, right? So Lean likes evidence. Lean doesn't lie. Lean loves metrics. Um, one of the things that the Lean software development community likes to do is they talk about looking historically at your real data. And from your real data, you can tell what your variance is and, and how quickly you'll be able to do things. And they've got this thing where this is a normal distribution curve. So your software falls into this normal distribution of some things are small and some things are large, but mostly they're in the middle. So you can use the two sigma, two times the standard deviation, and go, well, about 75% of our stuff falls under this line. No, you can't. It turns out that the software, and this is from data that a company called Rally came up with. I'm quite good friends with a lot of the Rally guys. And they actually measured with a big customer what the distribution was like. And they found some really interesting things. They started mapping on a graph dates on which stories or features were completed. And the height represented how long they'd been in play for. Um, it's actually story length rather than story. Sorry, I've mislabeled axes, which is also lying and a really bad thing to do. Um, and they found this really interesting phenomenon. It turns out that more things are completed on a Monday than any other day of the week. Because devs don't like to check in on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> right? It, things like that completely skew the data. 
So when you're actually doing these distribution curves with your data, it's not real data. It's data that users have already lied to you about, that devs have lied to you about, because they didn't mark it done, because they didn't want to check it in, because it was Friday afternoon. So the distribution is not a normal distribution. It turns out they, they did an experiment with it, and they said, if you were to put aside 100,000 to compensate people every time you failed your service, you'd be short by 400,000. Every time you failed to get something in before when you said you would, it's five times as bad as you think it is. So it's not 95% of our stories come in, it's 75% of our stories come in. And a lot of them are over this, this line that we think should be two times the standard deviation or whatever the 95% are line is. And they plotted these percentile lines on the date graph, and they were all over the place, absolutely all over the place. So we can't even trust the real data we're getting. There is one piece of data that surely has to be accurate, right? Bug count. We know that bug counts, when they go down, it's good. When they go up, it's bad. OK, I'm going to tell you a real story. Went to see this little company. And this is a company that I thought they were amazing. They came to Extreme Tuesday Club in London, a couple of them, and they said, well, we're really nervous to be here because we've kind of self-trained ourselves and we don't know whether we're agile enough to belong here. You know, I've been blogging recently about humility, and these guys were pretty humble. We don't know whether we're agile enough. I said, how often do you release? They went, two, three times a day. I went, to your live environment. They went, yeah? I went, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what your process is, you're fine. Um, and it turns out they had quite an experimental, quite a curious nature to all the people in the company. And they found it curious that they had quite a high bug count, and they wanted to solve this. So what they did was they hired another dev and rotated an existing development member through the role of bug fixing. So an experienced guy was bug fixing, and they were training up the new one as part of the team. And the bug count went down. Yay. And this was working so well, they hired a second dev and did the same thing. Put him in the team, bring another experienced dev, and rotate them through this bug fixing role. Just the experienced devs. Bug count went up. Wasn't that the dev was bad. He's doing a good job wasn't that you know, the team had grown to be unwieldy. That seemed fine. They finally looked at where the bugs were coming from, and it turned out that the users had noticed they were fixing the bugs, so they'd started reporting them. The bug count they had previously was only the ones they'd noticed. It was lying. <laughs> right? we, we have so much dishonesty in our processes. But there is a clue in that as to how we can create an environment in which we're more honest. Making it easy to be honest, making it safe to be honest, can help us to say, we don't know. This is our reported bug account. Making it easy for the users to report bugs. Yes, your count is going to go up. Apparently, it happens when you put a policeman on the beach, reported crime goes up too. So I'm going to share something which I have used a lot. This is the Prime Directive for retrospectives. And the idea of the Prime Directive is it should make it safe. Regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job with they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. We understand and truly believe that we all did the best job we could. And my friend Tobias Mayer, who I respect, turned around and went, no, you don't actually believe that. <laughs> it's lying, right? We don't. Sometimes we perform magnificently, other times we mess up, and mostly we're somewhere between the two extremes. And when you accept that, then you might be able to move on. But as long as you're pretending that you all did a really amazing job consistently the entire time you were working and you were never tired and you never went out to the pub very late the night before you were due to do your talk, 
Um, <laughs> it's, it's great, you know? We, we are human. And accepting that is really important as well, I think. When I did the Respect for People talk, I ended up with a plea to, for forgiveness. We are human, we will make mistakes. We will even tell ourselves lies so that they're convincing when we tell them back. It's a normal human thing. I can actually see that slide. Oh, it is fine. There we go. It looked like it was messed up on my thing. OK. Um, I want to share a little bit more of a story around safety and retrospectives, because it's really important to me. This is a safety check that I normally do when I'm with a team. And it's just numbers from one to five, where five is, I feel really safe to express my opinions, and one is, I'm just going to pretend it's really safe, which is the worst kind of safety you can have. Um, I did this with this team, and the project manager scribbled five on the post-it note and threw it in the middle, and all the rest of the team went, five, it's fine. And he said, we get on really well, it's, it's not a problem. So the next time I did a retrospective with them, I said to them, we've got some offshore guys who are due to come the week after. I would like to practice this with you properly, OK? What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure you all use the same post-it, same pens, Sharpie pens, and you're going to fold them so that nobody can see it. You're going to write it in private and then pass them to me. And the first one we unfolded was a four. And the project manager went, who wrote that? I said, can we do this properly from now on? They're like, yeah. And there were threes in there. There were a couple of fives. But, and it was still a bit really valuable to have the retrospective, but it was obvious that not everybody felt they could be honest. And knowing that was really important. And it started making people consider whether they were being respectful enough, whether they were being open enough. So the biggest plea that I really want to give to you guys today is this. Don't let your process hide your ignorance. Hiding your ignorance will cause you to be dishonest about things. Um, if you look at Wikipedia's definition of a lie, it has like 15 different categories. And there's one where you pretend to have more certainty about a subject than you actually should. And Wikipedia refers to that as bullshit. <laughs> right? Don't do that. If you are uncertain, and try and find out how uncertain you are. Imagine how uncertain you could be, because there is stuff you don't know that you don't know. And share that uncertainty as honestly as you can. I was, thank you, I was asked as part of a stand-up, the project manager, we were another project, um, two months to the deadline, and the PM said to us, she said, um, guys, do you think you're going to make the deadline? And nobody responded. Which, as far as I'm concerned, is that, you know, there's, there's a message in there in and of itself. But, you know, are we going to make it? We're, we're going to make it, right? I said, well, I'll tell you what, guys, how about we vote? One, if you think we're, going to make, we're not going to make it. Two, if you think we might make it. And three, if you think it's not going to be a problem. One, two, three. And Everybody in the ring voted ones with a few twos, some twos. I got in so much trouble for doing that, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so have the courage to do it anyway. There is nothing wrong with discovering information. There is nothing wrong with sharing the truth. See if you can find ways to make your environment forgiving and safe so that you can share that truth. And don't let your process hide your ignorance. Thank you very much. So I've left, I have left plenty of time for questions because I really like having conversations about this stuff. Um, excuse me. Do any of you guys have any questions? Do you want me to tell any more outrageous stories? <laughs> I've got a few. I know Dan North, so there's, there's plenty there. Um. What's a lunivore? What's a lunivore? OK, so um, lunivore is the dragon that eats the moon in the lunar eclipse. And it's a really important symbol for me, because this, this red moon, 
When there is a lunar eclipse, I remember my mum waking me up at two in the morning when I was a child so we could go out and see the lunar eclipse. The full moon is brilliant and bright and very beautiful, and we see it every single month, and nobody pays the same attention to the full moon that they do to the eclipsed one. It's not about the brilliant stuff you can do, it's about the different stuff that you do. And this is another part of this message about discovering the risks, discovering the differentiators, discovering the things that are new that nobody else has done. So please, go do that, because you're human beings and you're awesome. Any other questions? How can you improve the honesty culture in the company? Um, first of all, I think it is really important to have personal resourcefulness. So I will occasionally play the political game if I am feeling a bit under the weather. Um, I did take a lot of flack off of Twitter for the last talk, and I felt really down afterwards, and then I wasn't on Twitter for a bit because I didn't want to have those conversations anymore. So if you feel like you need to withdraw, do that, it's perfectly okay. Get yourself some sleep. Don't stay out drinking till two in the morning, especially not with Dan. Um, and, <laughs> you know, be forgiving to yourself. Um, and recognise when you're not in the right frame of mind. It's especially important, I think, if you're giving feedback or looking for feedback for yourself, to have a state of mind where you have some resourcefulness of your own. Otherwise, it's really hard to, to be brutally honest with people. Um, second, Try and give other people that resourcefulness as well. Try and make their lives easier and more friendly and more fun. And I am disrespectful, but I try to do it for humor reasons, and I apologize for it sometimes. Um, especially to the Scrum community, who I've, I've tweeted about a lot this week. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, Scrum make you do this commitment thing. And that really bugs me, because that process says we want you to, to say that you will finish this stuff. And if there's things that you've never done before in it, you can't make that commitment honestly. And I think that is dishonest, to make a commitment about stuff that you've never done before. You can do spikes and time box them, and maybe you'll get more information out of it. Um, but I'd much rather just say, you know what, let's just do all the risky stuff first. I guarantee if you do do all the risky stuff first on a project, your velocity measurements will be like this, all over the place. And they will not give you useful information because you have no idea how long it's going to take to do things, and your estimates will all be lying. Right? So be careful with some of those scrum processes that cause you to force to have those lies um, and make promises that you can't keep. Um, if you want to really be honest, get those resourcefulness, get the forgiveness in the process. If somebody's having a go at you for missing your commitments at the end of a scrum sprint, suggest to them that all that's going to happen is the devs are going to start estimating higher, and if that's what they want, they should carry on. But it'll still be, now the estimates are lying even more. Well done. Um, most project managers do actually get that. They're not promises, they're estimates. Get the forgiveness into that process and be an example of it yourself. Be brave, be courageous. Stand up for the things that you know people are lying about. Right? And pay attention to your build. It's your friend. <laughs> what, if what if the truth puts people's jobs at risk? Um, there's a thing that Wikipedia refer refers to as emergency lie, and the example they use is, you know, you know where a husband's wife is, but you're not going to tell him because he's going to beat her up. That was the example they use in Wikipedia. Um, if you're going to tell the truth and people are going to get fired, I honestly think that's going to happen anyway. All you're doing is hiding the information. If you have that information, Maybe some of them will go, hey, our jobs are at risk, let's go rescue this. Or, um, hey, we should go find some other jobs somewhere else. Uh, there was a lovely little software house that I went and visited, and they were doing really, really well for a long time, but then the market changed. And they recognized that they were not going to be able to get the work in and closed down 
making sure that all their staff could go to their next job and, and help them find those new jobs. And they closed down while they were still in profit without having to go into administration or anything like that. And I reckon that was really honest behaviour. And that must have been a hard conversation to have with the staff, but they were honest about it. While I was at ThoughtWorks, um, ThoughtWorks were also pretty honest. Every time there was any kind of market imbalance or, or problem, they would tell us about it, um, and we had access to the information, and there was never really panic. There was a lot of, of, of bitching and, and people, you know, trading insults, but that's thought workers for you. <laughs> I'm an ex. I, I, I'm as bad as they are, as you can tell. Any other questions? I had a lovely quote the other day, which was, um, I can't remember who said it. They don't want a quarter-inch drill, they want a quarter-inch hole. The customer doesn't want to know how uncertain something is. He wants you to help him solve a problem. And there may be easier ways of solving that problem. There are ways of trying things out and experimenting with them to solve the problem. And I think at a large scale, you can say, hey, we reckon we can solve that problem for you in this span of time. Um, so in the perils of estimation talk that Dan, uh, blog post that Dan's written, he says, if he wants to estimate how long it's going to take to write a particular web page, he finds eight guys who've written a similar size thing, gets them into a room and goes, how long do you guys reckon it's going to take? And they go, six devs, one year. And he goes, great. And that's about as accurately as you can estimate. And there's still uncertainty inherent in it. You know, There is risk. Um, I don't think you can ever hide it. But what you can do, if you're honest about the uncertainty, and if you're doing it up front first, is say, hey, guys, this is going to be way harder than we thought it, is. it was. It's simply not going to be possible. You know? uh, it's why the guaranteed success with Agile really winds me up, because Agile does not guarantee success. If you're doing it well, it guarantees that you'll find the failure fast. And you will find failure because there's stuff you, that's new and you've never done it before, and some of it won't work the first time. So Agile guarantees failure, lots, until you happen to find one that isn't failing. Well done. Now you can release, and it's all good. Well, except that it isn't if you're me and bring the Guardian travel site down. Uh, that was a data bug, by the way. It was um, We were releasing to an environment that was production-like, and it turned out that was also a lie. Um, who knew? Does that answer the question? Sorry, I did say I was going to repeat the questions. I hope I've made sense to the video at the back. Um, any other questions? I keep telling other speakers, you know, repeat the question, guys, as soon as it's me. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, completely forgotten. What do you do about gaming the system? What do you do about gaming the system if you have a lot of honest people? Um, I actually did a talk about this. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it. It's called Learning and Perverse Incentives, the Evil Hat. And I have an evil hat. Um, it's a big black top hat, and I wear it for that talk. I metaphorically put it on when I was with a company. This was a big hedge fund, right? Big international hedge fund. And they were having a meeting to discuss their KPIs. And they, they had worked out that measuring devs by the number of lines added was a bad thing to do. So they were going to measure devs by the number of lines they had changed. And they were going to measure the PMs by the number of obstacles they removed from the path of their team. And they invited me because they knew I was quite into gaming things and into KPIs. I'm, I'm anti-KPIs, but I have some opinions about them. So into them in that way. Um, and I sat there just watching them come up with all these metrics. And towards the end, they said, so Liz, what do you think? I said, can I put my evil hat on? They said, you're what now? My evil hat, right? Here's what I'm going to do if you give me these KPIs. And even if I don't have my evil hat on that is making me gain those KPIs, I'm going to do it anyway because subconsciously I will believe that this is how you value me. I'm going to rename a class that's used all through the system because, you know, people lie in their class names. And I'm going to correct it. Only I'm human, so I'll have got it wrong and I'll change it back because it turns out my mate Dan is right most of the time. Um, 
So I'm going to change it all back. So that's 500,000 lines of code. Great. Um, as a PM, what I'm going to do is even worse, right? I'm going to get my mate in DevOps to just put all of the tickets for my team to the back of the queue, unless I can bug him about them and remove those obstacles. And if I see an obstacle coming, I'm not going to stop it hitting the team. I'm going to wait till it's hit the team, and then I'm going to remove it because I get my brownie points. Now, you might think that PMs don't behave this way. I'm going to tell you another story. I was... <laughs> I was in this project, and this, this was one of the most weird places that I've ever worked. Um, the person who had hired me for this said he opened the fridge one, when he got there, and he went to get some milk out the fridge and discovered every single person had their own bottle of milk with their name on. <laughs> right? That's collaboration for you. Um, but this, this organization, this scrum master, newly trained scrum master, he'd come from a development role, had been trained as a scrum master, and he, said, he was nervous. He said, this really weird thing has just happened. I got this email from this other project manager, not somebody I know at all. He's holding an emergency meeting to rescue the project. I said, but you're going live next week. Yep. And it looks fine. You don't need rescuing. Yep. Well, what did he say? And he says, we've got too many bugs. And he gave us a bug list from the previous week. I said, but you fixed all of those. Yep. And you must have told him that. Yeah. And he says, there's no chance that we can possibly have fixed them all, so he's going to hold an emergency meeting to rescue the project. And I thought about it. I thought what it would take for a project manager to wade in with their size nines into somebody else's business, you know? And I asked, do they give bonuses for rescuing projects here? He said, it's really funny you should say that. <laughs> All these project managers circling each other's projects like vultures. <laughs> quite, quite insane. It turned out that at a higher level, the way they got projects incepted in the first place was that if your project was really good and, and people liked it, you would get a bonus. And unfortunately, the guys who got to submit the projects were sharing the bonuses with the guys who got to accept the projects. Um, so there were a lot of projects. First law of economics. People respond to incentives, yeah. Uh, this is David, by the way. He and I had a great conversation about anthropology last night, um, as well as some illegal drugs, which we were talking about not taking. Um, and effects. <laughs> he might have been. <laughs> I, I like beer and coffee and chili sauce. Just in case anybody was looking to buy me a drink or, or give me a present, Tabasco is good. Amazon do giant bottles of Tabasco. They sell everything. That's not a lie. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else got any questions? With time? Brilliant. Thank you very much for coming, guys. Enjoy the, enjoy the keynote.